just because someone has a fancy camera and mm -hmm. can either edit well or pay an editor mm -hmm. to edit that program, that doesn't necessarily mean that that piece of content is going to be successful. Production quality does not guarantee success. However, it's like adding salt and pepper to a dish, or it's like putting mm -hmm. that, that little garnish on top. Hi, Casey. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Technically, again, because we did a LinkedIn Live a year ago. We're going to give a little bit like TLDR right now on this episode. But like, if you really want to, we will definitely link the other video into maybe beginning or the end or like maybe a separate episode. You should definitely check it out. So that one is focused on how creators are creating content. And then for this one, we're going to focus more on like the business side of things. So to give the audience a little bit of background of Casey, Casey have over 3 million followers on TikTok and he have over 500 million views. When he started making TikTok, he was like basically second year into the law school. And then he was making kind of like how he lost weight by the videos. The first video he made was like a 15 second video of his physical transformation and then to now you know he is a million views creator to start the show i would love the audience to get to know you a little bit so do you want to tell us like the tldr of how you started and how you got here sure will do so like you said i'm casey rosenberg i started making internet content primarily on tiktok my second year of law school which was just a few years ago making videos online was something i've always wanted to do when i was little you know, I'd make little videos with my friends and we'd post them on YouTube and that was a lot of fun. But I was really looking for an outlet to just do something different than the monotony of being in law school every day. And this was right before the pandemic hit. Like you mentioned, I lost some weight. I uploaded a video. That was my first video. There wasn't a rhyme or reason to why I chose that as my first video, but I put it up there. I went to bed. I never thought about it. I logged on a TikTok three days later, however long it was, and I saw that it had over 200,000 views. From that moment, I was hooked. I was just in awe of what made that video do so well, especially because I've never posted anything before. And ever since then, I've been both chasing, studying, and working with both myself on how to create viral videos as well as with others. And like I mentioned, I started doing this in law school. So I graduated in 2021, passed the Nevada bar exam in 2022, and also work as an attorney working with content creators, people like myself to make sure that they're getting good deals and protecting their intellectual property. Okay, so you mentioned about like you're working with creators who protecting their intellectual property. I'm definitely curious about like, what does that look like for you? And then from a personal level, basically nowadays, like how do you structure your day? Since like being a lawyer is a full-time job as well as so, like being a content creator is another full-time job. And on the other hand, from a professional perspective, this is like a question that I was planning on asking later, but like as creator, what are some legal issues that people would encounter in this creative world? Because some people have a manager, but like as small creators, maybe we don't have the budget to hire a full-on legal team to help us. What are things that people typically encounter in that zone? Sure. I think that last question you asked really ties into the first question uh, you asked, which was... You know, what does protecting intellectual property look like for a creator? And of course, there's a lot more nuance than what I'm going to explain over the next couple of minutes. But I think the most important thing and the most issues that I've seen, as well as I think a lot of creators experience is what happens when they sign a contract. And that contract mm -hmm. can be working with a social media company itself. That contract can be working with a brand to promote a product, anything in between. And there is a lot of the fine print, so to speak, that you know is never really discussed in school. It's never discussed online. And of course, the brands offering you the contract are never going to you know, highlight that with, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> with a big, bright marker. The big issue always has to do, it seems like, I shouldn't say always, but has to do with how long those companies have the right to use either your image or the content mm -hmm. or anything like that. I have seen a lot of unfortunate contracts where a creator will get an offer from a brand. Financially, it's a great deal. So of course they sign. But what they didn't realize is throughout all of the legal jargon, they also signed away, you know, for example, maybe two years of their image 
two years of using mm -hmm. that video. And as we both know, in the internet world, especially for creator, two years is like 200 years in real time, it feels like. Totally. There is so much time and there is so much that happens within two years of a content creator's career where it might not seem like it's an issue at the time of signing, but if you're a content creator, you sign a contract and you're allowing a brand to use your image for, we'll use that two-year example. You know, you might have 100,000 followers on the day you sign that contract, but for all you know, two years later, you might have 2 million followers can demand a lot more when you're doing a deal. And that brand is almost making out or running away with essentially what's free IP. And what I mean by that is they're able to still use your image, the videos that you created, maybe any pictures, the list can go on and on, but a lot of brands will be able to latch onto that and use you more than, and get more value out of you than what you got in return in your contract. What is the typical term that you would sign for something like this? And I'm curious about your, since like you're the expert in both legal and the creator world, you know, number one is like the time of how long a brand can use. Like, but from a creator perspective, do you really take down any commercial? Like, for example, for me, if I do a podcast or like a YouTube video and I insert a commercial there, what is some easier way for me to, let's say, like two years later, I took it down or like, do I just leave it there? What is the norm in the industry to keep this thing going? And also, like, I think a lot of people work with brands that they love, but a lot of people that especially the younger or less influential creator, yeah, so people would take whatever they can take to make a living, right? Maybe they're not exactly familiar with the product the brand brought on how can we kind of like protect ourselves to say something to do the balance of like making money as well as like not get into any legal trouble if people really you know the product actually became like the problem mm -hmm. to answer that first question which has to do with sort of the length of terms of course it depends on the contract and every contract's different mm -hmm. but usually when i'm negotiating something i think allowing a brand or a company to sort of use my IP for a three-month period is a good amount of time where they're able to get any impact out of the video that I create mm -hmm. or you know, the pictures I post. And I'm able to benefit from that as well, obviously, by being able mm -hmm. to make a living. Like I mentioned before, you know, three months is like three years <laughs> in the internet world. So anything longer than that, I would usually be very hesitant about. Now, there are caveats. For example, let's say you make an agreement where that brand can use the video that you create for them for a three-month period. Well, you can also add in the contract where the brand might be able to use it for a fourth and fifth month. However, they have to pay you more money. Mm. So there are always those little caveats that are very important. A lot of creators, even big creators, there's either not the financial means to hire an attorney or frankly, it's just still not you know, financially beneficial to, let's say, have an attorney look at every single contract. If someone is going that route, I would say it is so important to just read the contract, even if it seems intimidating, even if it's 12 pages long, just try to read it the best you can. Read, ask questions. Google is your friend. That is very important. And there are going to be a lot of those things in the contract that anyone, you don't have to go to law school to understand. And for example, it might be the term that a company is going to use your video for a certain amount of time. So mm -hmm. I think overall, it, it sounds like such a simple piece of advice, but it is incredible how many people don't read the fine print. And it's the fine print that always causes problems down the road. Totally. I'm curious, when it comes to forming these contracts, is there any like template that you would recommend us? By the way, we need to create that template. <laughs> yeah. This is like on the set. No. <laughs> I, I I really well one I, I appreciate the uh, the encouragement as well as it feels more official saying so on a podcast and that is something that I am planning on doing so uh, what I will be doing in the future I guess this is maybe a mini announcement is creating sort of a, I don't know if I'd call it a class or a series mm -hmm. but provide a lot of that basic legal educational information to creators, you know, what they should look for in a mm -hmm. contract, things to avoid, red flags, green flags. With that in mind, there isn't necessarily a template, but a lot of companies use very, very similar looking contracts. At, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, 
a contract without getting into too much of the nitty gritty of it all. You know, a contract is mm -hmm. relatively simple in the sense where, you know, it has terms and conditions and you either agree to it or not. And it's just, oh, geez, I, I could go on forever, but that's such an important thing to do is reading in the small print, you know, how long these terms are going to be. So many mm -hmm. content creators see the money that's being offered and they sign instantly. But mm. creators need to realize that there is value in their image and there is value in allowing a brand to use their image for a very long period of time. Another quick question is like, you know, since I'm in the finance or tech area, a lot of the product are not necessarily like you can further do due diligence, for example, any kind of crypto related companies. If you're not technical, it's really hard for you to like understand the mechanic behind it. Some of the factors I personally use to like judge if a company is worth to work with is based on like who backs them. Basically, I just believe in all these VC firms would do their due diligence if the founders or the team are like having the character to work on what they say they will work on. But I think based on some current events, it's really hard to tell like which company will like last or like which company will be able to deliver what they say they are. And I'm curious, like since we can't really guarantee on the product side of things, we can only make our best judgment. What are some clouds that we can use to like insert into our I guess like contract agreement or like maybe even in our content to be like, hey, we're gonna say what we think it is, but like, you know, we're also not guaranteed this is like a financial advice or anything. I typically would add this is like a personal opinion, blah, blah, blah. But like, how do you kind of like protect yourself in that sense? Also protect your audience. Like, although you may think it's a really good product at the time, you know, you never really know like three months later what's going to happen. As content creators, I think one of our most important duties, if not our most important duty is to maintain that trust with our audience and to not steer our audience in the wrong direction. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, how good are the brands that we're partnering with? There are a lot of instances where, you know, content creators have partnered up with, let's say, a cryptocurrency company mm -hmm. or an NFT company, just because those were very in vogue over the last couple of years. And those companies went belly up or we found out that those companies were embezzling money. They weren't honest. The list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very important that as content creators, we fully trust the product or mm -hmm. trust the pop product to the best of our ability. And that requires doing a little bit of extra research that requires us to see, like you've mentioned before, who's investing in these companies, especially if it's a startup company? What is their goal? Have these founders had a track record before? You know, Do they have a LinkedIn profile, for example? There are an amazing amount of red flags when it comes to partnering with companies that can be found in a quick Google search. Mm -hmm. I've seen companies where I've gotten lucrative offers, but I look them up in they're ghosts online. You can't find mm -hmm. anything about them. You don't know where they're located. And of course, that is hey, me, a red flag. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a red flag to where, you know, you can't partner with them. That's not fair to you because that's not fair to your audience. And I think that is the most important thing. You also mentioned the importance of, you know, being honest, stating your disclaimers of this is what I know, this is what I don't know. And if you're promoting a brand that's such an important thing to do is be honest with your community. Partner with brands that you actually use, or if a brand reaches out, use the product or service before you promote them. Mm. Because there is nothing worse than promoting a product and it being a complete dud. You not only ruin the trust that you built with your own audience, but it also really hurts your image when it comes to future promotional opportunities. I'm also curious, like, how do people typically structure these deals, right? From my unofficial advice from friends, <laughs> or like some people are like doing half up front, half later, and then some are doing like episode by episode or video by video, and then some are signing like a package and then like they can insert wherever they see fit. I'm curious, like, what are the industry standards for these type of deals? And then what if, like, the people who decided to do the payment later and then the payment was not there? What are some legal action you can take? Do you send them, like, a uh, 
notice like, hey, if you're like not paying me about X, Y, Z day, we're going to get into a lawsuit. How, how can smaller creators to protect themselves in that way? Creating an industry standard is the million, if not billion dollar problem. If there was an industry standard, life would be so much easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there isn't an industry standard. And you're right. Some creators, they get the money up front. Some creators get half up front, half later. Some creators don't get paid until 60 days after the video is uploaded. And some <laughs> creators don't get paid at all. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> I, <laughs> and I've done deals every which way. I think the most comfortable deal is at least the brand providing a 35% deposit up front. Mm. Usually when I work with larger brands, that's not an issue. And it also, for me, is a good sign that, hey, not only do they have at least some of the money, but they work with you on a timely manner. Mm. So I do think it is very important in a perfect world that you do get some percentage of what they're going to pay you up front, because that money is also important to go to the production of whatever you're going totally. to make. Yeah. And also, you know, your time as a content creator is valuable you never know. So this is unrelated to getting payment up front. But before I forget, what is also very important when negotiating contracts as a content creator mm -hmm. is it's very important to negotiate the amount of reshoots, the amount mm. of redrafts, things of that nature. Mm. If you don't have that in your contract, you might be overwhelmed with having to rewrite a video time and time again to the point Agreed. where financially... It's not beneficial to have signed mm -hmm. that deal. It's it's not beneficial to have, you know, promoted that product. So that's very, very important. So that was a little tangent off track, but super important for content creators to negotiate how many reshoots and how many drafts the brand is going to work with. You're literally saving the audience like thousands of dollar consulting fee, but like it is true. Some people would um, I typically would take whatever the brands want me to say and then like rewrite it or something. But like it could be turned into like a massive production thing because if they don't like the video or whatever, you're taking a lot of time and effort and maybe even money for your production team. That's like a lot of upfront cost. And I'm so glad that you are mentioning this because this is definitely something that I feel like most people probably don't know. And thank you. This, this isn't even, you know, a, a legal education thing, but something that is also very important to do as a content creator is mm -hmm. even if it's not in the contract itself, clarify as much as you can with whoever you're in contact with doing your brand deal. Clarifying could be what clothes are you going to wear? What sort of lighting are you going to have? What you can and cannot show? What type of language are you going to use? What sort of audience do they want you to reach? Sometimes the brands do not provide you any of that information, mm -hmm. but they still know what they want at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't help you as a content creator tailor your content to what they want. And also, it, as we mentioned, you can get stuck going down the rabbit hole of having to redo things over and over again to a point where because your time is valuable, it just pretty much ruins that relationship. You're stuck working way too long on a project that should have been much shorter. Totally. What about like if they want you to guarantee X amount of views? And I've also heard about people that are like, OK, so we're going to give you X amount of money. And then if it doesn't hit X amount of views, you need to insert it into the next video. Because I personally feel like views is like a really hit or miss because I feel like getting the message to the right people is more important than getting the message to everyone, especially if we're selling like any SaaS related product. You just want the two or three potential larger buyers to hear your brands, but like then everybody who probably not even having the purchasing power to hear it. So I'm curious, like when brands talk about views, what are some of your responses and how do you put that into anything that like you would say that's like a you know, legal perspective you hit the nail on the head it does not really matter how many views your promotional content gets what really matters is the impact that that promotional content makes mm -hmm. if a brand wants me to or wants a client to have a certain amount of views or they're not going to get paid or the rate's going to be less <laughs> 
Well, first thing I do is say no. And I would never agree to a deal like that because mm -hmm. the internet is so ridiculously fickle. You never know what's going to happen. In a perfect world, you upload it. It gets millions of views, but no one knows if a piece of content is going to be successful or not. And brands have to roll the dice and trust that they're choosing a content creator that's going to try their best. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way street. You as a content creator need to trust the brands, but brands also need to trust you as a content creator. Mm. Now, let's say you put your heart and soul into creating a piece of promotional content and it flops miserably. Well, like mm. I mentioned before, that is the roll of the dice with creating social media content. But also there are so many factors that could have played into that. It mm. could be if the brand provides an overly aggressive or overly detailed instructional <laughs> piece of how you need to make the content. Well, that might not be organic to what you as a content creator make. So that could have a significant impact on the video. You know, there are just so many things that can affect whether a video is successful or not. And mm -hmm. the amount of variables that a brand adds to that equation significantly affect the success of that video. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say they're launching a campaign and then they want to track your progress on your website or on your like campaign, like the video that you made. What are things that you could possibly say to the brands to be like, okay, so number one, like we cannot really guarantee this. And then number two is like, sometimes, you know, it's not necessarily people are going to click your link. People may hear about an ad like overall 10 times before they make a purchase or over the internet not just one podcast or one TikTok video. It's like, what do you suggest your clients to do? Uh, or like yourself, because you are technically one of the biggest creators in the world. How do you manage these kind of situations? I am a fan of any sort of tool that collects data because data is not mm -hmm. only beneficial for brands, data is beneficial for you as a content creator. And you can look at that data and see, okay, this is how I did a previous campaign. If mm -hmm. it didn't do well, I can look at, you know, different data points and see, okay, how can I create a more successful campaign in the future? If you create a piece of promotional content and it does not do well, that is not the end of the world. Creating a piece of promotional content is night and day different than creating a piece of organic content that you'd usually do for whatever account that you're running. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's important. That's the an important thing to clarify, but I think data tools are fine. I just don't think that it is fair for someone to use some sort of data tool and then say, okay, we're going to pay you less because of what the data says. Mm -hmm. That should all be agreed ahead of time. And if there is some sort of stipulation where there is a and but, or it depends on, mm -hmm. I'm never going to sign a contract like that. That is not mm -hmm. worth my time because there are, like I mentioned before, way too many variables for me to have the sole responsibility of guaranteeing a certain amount of views. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to use every best practice I've learned as a content creator because I want the brand to be happy. A happy brand mm -hmm. means future promotions. Happy. And that's good. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I, I mean, happy. I should put that on like a deck. <laughs> exactly, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, happy brand, happy life. You know, it, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. It's important to get paid for all of the time that you're spending on trying to do the best you can for a brand. Totally. Okay. Say you have a bad performing video or like you just launched something and then like, you know, the launch number is, let's say like one of 10 of your, whatever, like your best performing video is. And then the brand come to your page and then saw that and then like that become their negotiating power. They're like, okay, we saw you, your reason video are not performing that well or like your reason post or whatever. Your reason content is not as well. So when they started using that as their leverage to negotiate press with you, how do you do the negotiation? Because I'm pretty sure like some brands will just take advantage of that. And then my personal take is like, you should never settle for less because like you should know what you're worth. But like, I'm curious, what are some responses you would give to the brands or like people who want to work with you? Essentially, I feel like a business decision is a business decision. Like you have to make what's best long-termly for your business. But like, 
that means maybe sometimes you take the money and do whatever you can with it. But like sometimes it means maybe you just keep saying no until you get to whatever your ideal person is. Like, how do you balance those things? Number one, it's like if a brand give you some statement to like negotiate the price, and then like another part is how do you navigate the business situations throughout your creator journey when sometimes people give you something that you're not asking for. To answer your first question about, let's say you post a video、mm-hmm. and it's not performing well, and a brand reaches out and they say, "Hey, we'd like to do a deal with you. We're going to negotiate the price based on the last video that you created, and it's the video that did not perform well." Two things: one, that is ridiculous because, like we've talked about before, and what anyone would tell you、mm-hmm. is every piece of content performs differently. Now there are creators that get really good at creating consistent pieces of performing content.、Mm-hmm. The best in the business, I think, it's undisputed. Mr. Beast on YouTube、mm-hmm. is a great example of this. But、mm-hmm. even he has fluctuations, and I wish I could take credit for this. But this is the second thing: is there's a woman named Kaylee Reed. She owns the Hermana Agency in Canada. And she has a great strategy as a counter for a tactic like that.、Mm-hmm. Reed talks about taking instead of just the last video, it's more important to look in the aggregate. Take the last five videos, take the last ten、mm-hmm. videos, get the average from that because that's going to get a much better picture of how you as an account are performing over a certain period of time. One video is just too little. To go off of when it comes to negotiating a piece of content,、mm, totally. What are some good resources for these kind of like deal negotiating as well as like drafting a contract related things? And if a person that couldn't really hire a lawyer, like, what's your suggestion for them to do to get their own template or like? Ways to like kind of inform themselves. Also, like you know, even you have a lawyer. Like it's really hard to tell who is an expert in the space because every intellectual property lawyer can technically do what you mentioned, but not everybody have experience, right? Like, and then also everybody have their own perspective on what is right or wrong. I'm curious, like as a lawyer yourself, if you are hiring a lawyer or if you are like trying to do DIY this legal process, like. What are some things that you would take into consideration? I like what you mentioned, where it's if you have the opportunity、mm-hmm. to network and work with people who are already established in that field.、Mm-hmm. Now, as someone who's a content creator and an attorney, I'm fortunate to be able to、mm-hmm. be my own resource in a way when it comes to looking over contracts. But I know that that's not feasible and realistic for. Ninety nine point nine percent of content creators.、Mm-hmm. I wish I could give you a particular resource or a particular outline and say, follow this. This will tell you everything you need. It's so hard for me as an attorney to provide education without a, at least for me, to provide education without a particular contract that I'm looking at because everything、mm-hmm. I think is so different and everything is so unique compared to everything else. But I would say, a majority of contracts that are given to social media creators, they're not, you know, secretly manipulative. A lot of these contracts are relatively straightforward. I think just taking the time to read them will really alleviate ninety percent of the problems. Totally. Say if you are stru- like structure a deal for、mm-hmm. uh, a creator. I guess, like, what are let's say like five things that it must include in the contract? Some of the things that you already mentioned, like for example, how long does the contract last? And then number two is like maybe how many times you have to recreate this piece of content. What are other things that you would take into consideration、um, if a creator asks you to send me a contract template or something? Five of the most important things a content creator can have in their contract is the length of time the brand is able to use not only the video that you create、mm-hmm. but your image, your likeness, things of that nature.、Mm-hmm. Two, how many reshoots and rewrites a content、mm-hmm. creator has to go through before the final product is reached to upload. Three is 
how the money is going to be structured. What I mean by that is I think it's very important to get at least mm -hmm. some sort of payment up front. Mm -hmm. I don't think you necessarily have to ask for half, but I mm -hmm. like the number of 35%. I wish I had a reason, but when mm -hmm. I'm working with <laughs> brands, that 35% seems to be the magical percentage that everyone's happy mm -hmm. with doing. So I always shoot for 35% up front. I can't remember if that's three or four things, but that's other three. things, that's okay. three things. All right. <laughs> Number four would be, you know, what the video is going to look like. That can be what clothes are you going to wear? How is it going to be structured? What's the lighting going to be like? Because you never want to have some sort of argument over, well, this isn't what we thought it was going to be like. So we're not going to pay you, which is just a silly thing to have to worry about. And I think a fifth thing that's important when negotiating a contract is making sure it's structured in a way that it is not dependent on factors out of your control. Mm. Agreeing to factors out of your control as a content creator is one way to guarantee yourself to not <laughs> make as much money as you deserve. Those factors include guaranteeing a particular amount of views, mm. guaranteeing a particular amount of links and bio clicks, guaranteeing mm -hmm. a certain number of shares, all of those things mm -hmm. we don't have control over. No one mm -hmm. has control over that. So it is unfair for brands to put that burden on a content creator mm -hmm. when there is no guarantee to you know provide that no matter who you are. Totally. Okay. So two more things. I know that you have manager at TikTok and then like we both have like managers at LinkedIn. So like people can like directly chat with us Um, in terms of brand partnerships or like any people like on the business side, do you have an agent? And like, if you have, what are the typical agency deal look like? And then if you don't have, why is that? I guess like, why do you feel like an agency is not necessary for you? And then the second part of the question is, do you include the numbers of your views all the time? Or like, what are something that you would put into the deck to make yourself look good? And then also, you know, not selling yourself short because like your views is going up every day. I think if you're sending uh, some sort of creator deck to a brand that's talking about you, if you're providing data, I think demographic information is really mm -hmm. important. Anything that the app can provide you, of course, certain apps provide different things. For example, Instagram's analytics are way mm -hmm. more advanced than TikTok's analytics. But mm -hmm. providing brands those information, that information is very important. I think when it comes to working with an agency, just because I do create content, but I also work as an attorney, mm -hmm. I am not in a position where I am looking at you know, doing some sort of promotional piece of content every week or every two weeks. Mm -hmm. But I can see that that being a very beneficial thing for some creators to work with someone who's going to be out there hustling and grinding, getting those agreements. For me, though, all of the brand deals that I have done have come purely from them reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. I think having your email in your bio is a very underrated mm -hmm. practice. That's mm -hmm. all you need. If a brand wants to work with you, they're going to reach out. And I think that is also a very good way to just filter who you want to work with and who you don't mm -hmm. want to work with. Other than that, when it comes to working with an agency, it's very important for you as a creator to discuss with that agency how long they're going to represent you, mm -hmm. what percentage they're going to take. And it's very important for you as a creator before you sign anything or work with anybody to do that due diligence, see either who they've worked with in the past, what their reviews are, and just talk to your friends in, your, in the creator community. As a content mm. creator, just start asking around, what do you think about a particular agency? And you know, honesty is the best policy. You're going to hear what people really have to say. Mm. So- there's nothing wrong with an agency. For all we know, maybe I'll join an agency in the future, but right now I do work as my own agent. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of it. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times you don't need an agent to be a successful content creator or to create mm -hmm. content full time. Totally. Um, you have built a lot of industry relationships with other creators, right? First of all, like, how do you kind of like network to meet other creators? And 
Uh, number two is what are some ways to keeping in touch with everybody? Seems like they're not in the same content niche that you're creating. I think when it comes to creator networking, well, first of all, that that is true. A lot of the creators who I am friends with are not making similar content to what I make, but I think you see that with a lot of creator friend groups. And mm-hmm. I think the reason being is as a content creator, no matter what another content creator is making, you both have that appreciation for how hard it is and how much mm-hmm. work goes into creating a brand and creating you know, who you want to be as a content creator, establishing an audience. So mm-hmm. the mutual respect is extremely important. Mm. When it comes to actual networking, I wish I had some sort of grand strategy, but a lot of it really is if there's a creator who I think just put out an incredible piece of content, or I think they do an amazing job, I'll let them know. I will, you know, not only comment on a video, but if there's someone who I really want to talk to, or just give them my compliments, you know, I'll send them that DM on Instagram. Sending DMs, it's very underrated because Mm. I think people think that creators get a lot more messages than what they really do. Mm. So taking that time, sending a thoughtful message, complimenting them on what you like is just a great way to say hello. And that might start a relationship and you might work together in the future. I think it's very important to approach friends, especially as a content creator, approach creators in your space, not necessarily as looking at them as a future business opportunity, but, you know, just respect their craft, become friends with them, find out what they're doing. You can learn something from anyone who's creating content. And I think if you approach things with that lens, you're going to not only establish a great network of content creators and people to work with, but you can have lifelong friends too. Totally. I completely agree with you. You are both a really good business lawyer as well as like the um, content creator. I'm curious, let's say, because I live in Silicon Valley, I've encountered many startups and B2B companies. They want to kind of build a community or like connect with their audience on TikTok or on these like short form content. How can they find the right creator for them? Since like, most people's TikTok for your page is like really entertaining related th- stuff, like e- either people dancing or like cats and dog videos, <laughs> like Mr. Socks videos. But I don't know if you have that, but like, okay. So what are people doing right now to connect with you or like other creators? And how can they connect with the right creators as a brand? I think when it comes to finding the right creator for your brand, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And what I mean by that is... Sometimes there tends to be sort of, for lack of a better phrase, an echo chamber amongst brands. And and what Mm -hmm. I mean by that is, you know, a tech startup, you know, content creator and a tech startup follower, they might have the exact same for you page, or they might be following Mm -hmm. very similar content creators. And so they might reach out to a content creator who has a very similar audience and taste they'll create a video and there's not going to be an increase of traffic. Mm -hmm. And that's because brands need to reach out to content creators that they might not know personally or that exist outside of that bubble to where a new audience can be reached. Just because there are people that you follow does Mm -hmm. not mean that allowing them to make a video about your brand is going to reach a new audience because it might just be the same people watching and supporting those videos. Mm, totally so like if i work at a tech startup in the marketing department how do i like quickly know who is in the niche that i really want to watch and how should they find these people as well as like connect with these people i know you said something really good is always put like your email in the bio Is that like you know saw their email or whatever on the tiktok page what are some other ways so you can like connect with them if they don't really have that email or something I think, uh, you know, if you're reaching out to a content creator, first thing's mm-hmm. email. Second thing is Instagram DMs. Mm-hmm. Third thing is LinkedIn. And I'll put it this way. I, I feel comfortable enough to say that if a content creator has no way, at least on the surface, to contact them, I don't think it's worth your time. I think that 
You know, you want to work with content creators who are familiar enough with how the business works Mm -hmm. and content creators want to work with brands who are familiar enough with how the process works as well. When it comes to finding new content creators, Mm -hmm. you have your basics like, you know, search Mm -hmm. hashtags, see what's Mm -hmm. on your for you page. I'm surprised that there aren't more people that create accounts that Mm -hmm. just see what is the AI pushing out. So for example, you create a new account and you want to find tech videos. Well, just keep scrolling until you find a tech video, interact with it, because that's how the AI will know that you want more of that content. And then just start seeing what the AI gives you. And Mm. I think by doing that, it's a very quick and efficient way to see, okay, this is who the AI is currently pushing out when it comes to whatever content it is. So we're using the example of tech content. I'm very comfortable in saying within two hours, you -hmm. can create a very, very in-depth database of creators that you could work with by just seeing what the AI gives you over that two hour period. Totally. Okay. So one question for you is, by the way, I really think this is like a really good strategy, as you mentioned, like create a second page and then engage with the content because I never really engage I mean I watch them but like it's just like for me it's just like pure entertainment or like research purposes um but that's a really good point to like engage with the content so like you kind of feed into the system that like you want this more and another question is let's say you and I start a fund start like a venture fund like how do we market ourselves to the younger generation the gen z audience actually a lot of our listeners are people who are working at a fund or like people who are working in the venture industry. So I'm curious, since like the solo GP is like really booming, how do you stand out in the Gen Z ecosystem? First of all, Gen Z being, you know, products of the short form video generation. Mm -hmm. I think Gen Z is very, very good at sniffing out who is someone that is, you know, genuine and who is someone that's just trying to promote get eyeballs and and money, right? Mm -hmm. So I I think if you are trying to find a Gen Z audience, it's so cliche and I'll expand on this or find a way to expand on this, I promise. But being genuine is such an important thing to do. And what I mean by being genuine is, you know, act like an actual human being. Mm -hmm. I think A great example is someone being genuine and gets an insane amount of engagement is easier now because he bought Twitter. But Mm -hmm. if you were to look at Elon Musk's Twitter feed from, let's say, 2012 to 2016, the amount of engagement he gets or he got, I should say, because he was posting things that, let's say, you would only post on a private account. Or you would post things that you'd say in a group chat with your friends, but you'd be hesitant to post about, you know, (laughs) on on a public page for the world to see, right? Mm -hmm. There is some merit in approaching content creation or approaching engagement and reaching out to an audience with that strategy. Because I think people are at the point where because the internet is so saturated with people wanting to, you know, create startups and get people engaged with whatever they're promoting. In a weird way, the only way to stand out is to be more of a human and not like a robot when it comes to the content that you create. People would much rather see someone not completely polished, but being authentically Mm -hmm. themselves than, you know, (laughs) I don't, I don't know, some sort of parrot or robot of just Mm -hmm. using the same brand strategy as everyone else totally i completely agree right now being raw and like being really just like showing who you are as a person is like a lot more exciting but i also sense there's like maybe a trend that that like tiktok i guess like tiktok algorithm maybe gonna be favoring like the more production related things soon because i've heard about this on another podcast or something people are talking about like you know the evolution of youtube like at the beginning it was like a lot of meme videos cats and dogs and stuff like that and then like the production quality are like your phone or like something even lower and then nowadays like people are using film production camera like having a full set and stuff like that 
people are saying TikTok is like tapping into the longer form, which was like originally it was like under one minutes. Now it's like three minutes and like it's going to get longer and people who are in the niche are going to take off like people who are like with subject expertise and then they're going to create more like educational content instead of like just under pure entertaining stuff. So I'm I'm curious of your thoughts on like the that trend. Do you feel like people are going to be more polished day to day and like or do you feel like people are going to stay as like raw as possible? Someone being raw and authentic and production quality. I don't think that has to be necessarily an either or situation. Mm-hmm. I personally am a fan of the evolution of short form video and how production has gotten more involved and more creative because it gives it gives the ability to create just higher quality content and it gives you more freedom to differentiate yourself from other content creators. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're exactly right. It's you look at the timeline of internet content, right? You start off Mm -hmm. with, you know, these obscure sites like jib jab or funny Mm -hmm. junk or new grounds not that new grounds is an obscure site by any means but you're right it starts in this sort of meme format sort of flash video just messing around then someone creates something like stupidvideos.com where Mm -hmm. everything on that site (laughs) is some sort of humorous video And it finally took until I believe the release in 2005 for YouTube to be that Mm -hmm. platform, like you said, where, you know, anything can be posted at, you know, and the videos, of course, did start, you know, as memes There are a lot of lip sync videos, which there's a parallel to TikTok there. It is really interesting how it's taking the almost identical evolution that YouTube has taken. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you start with lip sync videos then people start vlogging and then those Mm -hmm. people who vlog start doing day in the life content and then the production value increases and i think that's a great thing Mm -hmm. i think that that is going to be a trend for tiktok i think Mm -hmm. that you know production quality is going to increase heavily Mm -hmm. but just because someone has a fancy camera and Mm -hmm. can either edit well or pay an editor to use, you know, to Mm -hmm. edit that program. That doesn't necessarily mean that that piece of content is going to be successful. Production quality does not guarantee success. However, it's like adding salt and pepper to a dish, or it's like putting Mm -hmm. that, that little garnish on top. It's nice. And I think people would much prefer to have that presentation than something that's a little sloppier. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we are, in a period where production quality is very important, but I don't think that it should be the priority. I am happy though, that we are coming to this sort of full circle, much like YouTube, where production quality is much more important than it used to be because it allows, I think, content creators more freedom to create their own voice and their own identity. For sure. What does that entail to like create your own like voice and identity? Because I think so the type of videos that you and I are making are half of that because I feel like, you know, you make listicle videos or like you make, you know, what is like uh, what's worse than prison food, (laughs) which is like hilarious. I feel like that video is like just that just got me. The videos that we're making is kind of like scripted than you see like a lot of these like younger YouTubers. Well, you are already really young. So basically they would just literally vlogging them going to the gym, vlogging them going, getting a coffee, vlogging them going to Sephora. And that's literally like their whole pillar of content. Let's say if you're like a business owner, like for you, you run your own like law firm or like consulting agency. And let's say like if we are running a company together, like a fund or like a startup or something, how do we make the content that's like relevant to the audience that we're trying to target, right? Like people who, if we're running a fund, we probably want to establish ourselves as like people with industry expertise knowledge, as well as like, you know, we want to show some personality like, oh, hey, come and see our office. Like, you know, here's like our OOTD of the day, blah, blah, blah. So basically you want to make the, the content that you want to make to be relatable, but also like, how do you showcase your expertise part? It is very important to differentiate who the brand is and who the creator is for that brand. Mm -hmm. Because what really matters is who the creator for that brand is. 
Now, there's a reason why I'm not making day in the life content. There's a reason why I'm not filming myself going to the grocery store. I'm frankly not witty and cool enough to That's wrong, film that. By the way. <laughs> I'm not witty and cool enough to film that and for people to watch. It's just not going to work. And I think that's why it's important for whoever is creating content, or if it's the owners or investors of that brand making the content or trying to get that engagement themselves to play around with different formats and see what works. Mm. It just because another startup or another brand is making videos in a particular way does not mean it's going to work for you because it mm. might not work for that creator's personality. It might not, you know, whatever the reason is, you need to, as a content creator or as a business, you need to figure out, you know, what you're good at and what you're not good at and use that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Just because other people are doing makeup tutorials does not mean that I, Casey Rosenberg, should start doing makeup tutorials to be a successful content creator. Mm -hmm. It's so dependent on the individual creator that I think a brand needs to take a lot of time do a lot of experimentation, see what works. You know, Lotus Cars on TikTok, it's just a meme page. I think it's a brilliant mm -hmm. strategy, but here's the thing. If I'm a startup or if I'm a business and I want to create an organic large presence online, I will not look or I don't think I should look at Lotus Cars mm -hmm. and say, okay, they're just posting a bunch of memes very similar to how Wendy's was uh, on Twitter in, I want to say, the early 2010s. Mm -hmm. Just because a brand is posting memes and being silly does not mean I, as a brand, am also going to post silly things and I will be successful. Mm -hmm. It just, it doesn't work that way. People can sniff out when you're trying to, you know, copy another brand or try to be you know, relevant with Gen Z, it just, it's mm -hmm. not going to work. You have to be true and authentic to what you can do as a content creator, play around. Maybe you have hidden talents, but mm -hmm. don't just blindly copy what other successful creators are doing because it just might not be the thing for you. And you're oh. missing out on other ways to showcase. You, you might have a mm -hmm. genius idea and it's just going mm -hmm. to take time and playing around with. Totally. Let's say like if you are starting today, right? Like what are some ways for you to like figure out what's your formula? Besides like looking at what's working for like other bigger creators. Because I think nowadays if I, let's say like I straight up copy you exactly what you do, I'm never going to be best at this because of you created your own category. And like another part is like, you know, the algorithm are different from like, you know, two years ago. Like, I mean, whatever works back then may not really work whatever it is today. For smaller creators, we may have to look at someone who is like maybe like two, three steps above us than like, you know, someone like yourself who is like already have like millions of floors and stuff like that. Uh, if you're starting today, like how would you, what is it, like, your mental roadmap to kind of like come up with your own template or like formula? And how do you like systematically, I guess, like create a system for yourself? Because I think it's super, super hard to create content every day. And you've done that for years, right? Like you've done like two videos a day for like a long time. I guess like, what would you do like to, if you were starting today? If I was starting today, the first thing that I would do is sit down and, you know, the, the obvious question is, you know, what kind of content do I want to mm -hmm. make? I would think about either the subject matter mm -hmm. or if I don't know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. What I would do is before I look at any other piece of content online, mm -hmm. I would create 10 pieces of original content. I would post all 10, not comparing it to anyone else and see how those videos did. Now, let's say mm -hmm. I post 10 videos that are relevant to the tech space. Well, mm -hmm. I see that those videos may not have performed too well. That's okay. What I would then encourage someone to do, and if I was starting up again, after creating those 10 videos, I would take note of what I think worked, what I think didn't work, then I would search either via hashtag or just through finding tech accounts online, whether it's, you know, Googling and seeing who the top results are or just seeing who the top creators are in the search bar. 
see what they're doing and compare and contrast. Because you can learn something from anybody, whether they're a big creator or a small creator. And then after, let's say, watching 100 videos, take detailed notes on those 100 videos in that space, and then create another 10 videos about what you learn from watching not only those videos, but also taking note of what worked and what didn't work in the videos that you created. And then it's just tinkering with that process every day. And like you mentioned, the algorithm changes every day. What that really means is what mm. people want to see changes every day. Mm. Humanity changes every day and that's okay. <laughs> the strategy that you're going to have <laughs> is going to be so different to the strategy you're going to have a year from now. And that's mm. okay. You just have to acknowledge that as a creator and you need to just be constantly tinkering. Sometimes things that you change are going to not work. Sometimes things that you change are going to work, but you're never going to know unless you just keep on, you know, messing around with what you're doing. And it's just, it's a never ending process and that's okay. Totally. Um, so you were involved in this program called Creative Learning Fund, right? Like, so basically TikToks, I guess like invested in like creators who are doing these like learning related content and we're both in like the LinkedIn first like cohort of LinkedIn Creator Accelerator. Um, how do you kind of like find out about these programs and what are some programs out there for, I guess, like younger creators or not younger, but like newer creators who are like just entered the scene and like, what are the benchmark that you have to hit to, I guess, like to be participating in these like programs? All of the programs that I've joined, I have been fortunate where someone from either that company has reached out to me or it, it's been something very similar no matter what program I've done. But I think the reason why people reach out to me is because I've had a proven track record, especially if you look at when I was focusing solely on posting, you know, I had a successful track mm -hmm. record at generating engagement. And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. all of these social media companies, they care about one thing and that's the data. And so as long as you are creating, you know, content that might, a buzzer goes off, you know, to some data scientist behind the scenes, I think that's a good thing. That's how a lot mm -hmm. of these companies will find you and reach out to you and you'll get a manager from, you know, the social media company mm -hmm. and it's very beneficial. I wish that there was some sort of template or some sort of format that you can follow that lets you join these programs or lets you get in contact with a manager, for example. Hmm. Uh, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, it seems relatively secretive. And for all we know, that could just be because there's just not enough people to hmm. run these programs to get the message out there, so to speak. So I think, you know, one is if you're a content creator and you're seeing all these funds and programs and you're not getting invited, don't be discouraged. You know, just because you're in one of these programs, I can promise you it's not going to be this life changing thing <laughs> that you might think. You're, you're imagining. We're the best program spokesperson ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is, you know, it's great opportunities. Of course, they're wonderful. And, you know, I would love to be a part of as many as I could be a part of. But even if you're not, it's, I, I can promise these are not life changing programs but just, you know, opportunities to see what social media companies want people to create either in the future, or they can use you for, you know, data collection, which is very mm. important. It's a very important, you know, fact and factor when it comes to creating a successful social media website mm. and, or platform, I should say, I'm just dating myself, calling things <laughs> websites, but I think as a content creator, it's important to be consistent and don't be afraid to reach out. If you find someone on LinkedIn that works with, and I use LinkedIn just because that's, I think, a great resource to find, you know, who works in whatever industry you want to look up is, you know, send someone a message. It It's not going to hurt you in any way to mm -hmm. reach out and say, hey, you know, I know that you've mentioned or I've read that you manage, you know, this particular program within a social media app. 
-hmm. How do I become a part of it? They mm. might not have an answer, but they might have an answer. They might take mm. a note of you for the future. It's just so important to not only get your name out there, but just being consistent. It's if you stay true to your goal as a content creator, people are going to come around to it eventually. It might not be today. It might not be next year. It might be a very long time. But mm. if you work at it for a certain amount of time, you're going to start getting results in order to stay updated with, you know, when are there going to be future programs for like TikTok, LinkedIn, Instagram? I think so like following someone like you is a great resource. Like following Grace Gong on LinkedIn, I think is an extremely important resource because you are someone who shares what's going <laughs> on in the tech space, not even just to like plug you and your own podcast, but, but it's true. It's, if you're a content creator and you want to find out about these opportunities, the only way you can find out about these opportunities is to follow reporters and insiders in the industry, people like yourself, and you know that information will follow. If you want to follow any legal advice, especially towards creator, you should follow <laughs> Casey. <laughs> I I will say, admittedly, uh, especially if you go see the content that I make and mess around with, it is definitely not legal in nature, but I have taken what you said to heart. And I think after having this conversation with you, I am realizing just how much of a disconnect there is from people that are drafting contracts to people mm -hmm. who are signing contracts every creator in between. So I promise I will take the time. It will take a while because if I do something, especially when it comes to legal education, I want to make sure I'm doing things right. But mm -hmm. I promise I will start creating a resource for content creators. I feel like that will be like just extremely valuable for everybody because there, as you said, like there's no industry standard. Like we should create something that people can use as like a good benchmark for themselves because newer creators like don't know i mean i'm constantly having conversation with other creators like people are also confused they don't really know what's like the standard contract and then they could be selling themselves shorts or negotiating a contract and then like in the end of the day like seeing their face on like a commercial they did 45 years ago yeah and, ex exactly yeah it's like bad and like this will be like really valuable resources for people because you are in such a niche that's like both from a legal perspective as well as like a from coming from a creator angle, like, you know, both side of things. Um, I feel like you're just like a perfect person for that. And like, I'm super excited for taking your course and like, you know, looking at these things. So, okay. I have a couple of fire round uh, question for you. Number one is like, what's your favorite book? I would say right now is, so I have gotten really invested into anything that is like cyber dystopian. So if it's, I know not a book, but take, you know, I got actually a great book would be like Dune's a great book, for example, mm -hmm. right? The one that I I obsess over, and it's it's such a simple book when you think about it. There is nothing complex about it, but I love the book Ready Player One mm. because it is a story about someone who is just trying to make it in the metaverse. Mm. And it's just it's it's not a, a cerebral read by any means. It's the cotton candy of books. But, you know, right now, that's something that I have picked up recently and read for a third time. So while my favorite book changes, depending on how I feel, the one that I love the most at this time is Ready Player One. I can prove this because I think you said this the last time. <laughs> like, yes. Okay. So number two is who would you invite to your dinner party? I would invite Benjamin Franklin. Can they be dead? Can they like come back? Yeah, of this? course. It's oh, your okay. party. So I thank you. I would choose Benjamin Franklin because I recently watched the Ken Burns Ben Franklin documentary and I had no idea just how much this one human being was able to do in their lifetime. And I find I would just love to ask him, you know, how he stays disciplined how he is able to be curious every single day. How is he able to be relatively optimistic? You know, he's also someone who became, you know, a relatively social outcast. 
when he was over in France, for example, he's had such a fascinating life to where I would just ask him way too many questions and then he'd leave the dinner party. Yo, you may able to do that because of like the currently AI is like trying to like bring all the dead back to life. Like, right? like these like chat system. You may <laughs> able to just chat with them on um, chat GPT or something. Um, so uh who made the biggest impact in your career? It's hard to name an individual person. So I will have to take the maybe expected answer and say I, I have to go with my family. It's I've been very fortunate to have grown up with a family who has always encouraged like me to do what I want to do, sort of follow my dreams, just, you know, try to be, do the best as I can. And I think growing up in that environment is very important, both as an attorney and as a content creator, because there are going to be a lot of days where as a content creator, you're going to work on something, you're going to put your heart and soul into it, and it's not going to go well. Or you know, as an attorney, you're not going to win every case that you participate in. And so I'm very fortunate to have had such loving family members that, you know, encouraged me to, if something doesn't go my way, to just get back up and keep working on it. So I would say that has had the greatest impact on my career. That's so sweet. I would say the same. I feel like family and like just like friends and family support is like literally everything because <laughs> Being a creator is like hit or miss every day. Like, so yes. you're basically on a roller coaster. Like, sometimes I'm just like so obsessed with the views that I'm like, oh my God, like, why there's like just like two views on my videos. And those are the time that you really kind of can benefit from chatting with just your family too. Like, people will tell you it's going to be okay. <laughs> like, so. yeah, that's at, at the end of the day, the most important thing is having people in your corner. And totally especially if you're choosing a line of work as up and down as content creation mm -hmm. or geez, it, it's the same thing when it comes to, you know, if you're trying to create the next big tech startup, you need to have family or friends or both that, you know, whether you fail or you're successful, they don't care about that. They care about you. And if you have oh. that support in your life, you're going to, have a much greater shot at being successful in what you're doing. Totally agree. Um, okay, we have the last, last question is, where can we find you outside of work? Oh, outside of work, I love nature photography. I love going out and, you know, getting that perfect shot. Recently, I was in Death Valley. I mm -hmm. was- uh, Yeah, I saw that on your Instagram, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was very surprised how photogenic a place called Death Valley is. Mm -hmm. I am guilty of being on my phone way too much, being on my computer way too much, and not necessarily because of work, because I am watching cat videos and I can't stop <laughs> scrolling. But having the outlet of being out in nature and you know where it's just silence, being somewhere where there is not a cell phone connection, it is, there's just something really nice about that. And then having to focus on one thing, focusing on getting that perfect shot. It, it's therapeutic in a way. Oh, wow. So that is definitely where you'd find me outside of this room that I'm in now. Thank you so much, Casey, for sharing with us. I can totally see that. And thank you so much for taking the time. You're just awesome to chat with, as always. And thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you. It's it's an honor. I mean, you go through who you've interviewed in the past and it's like, oh, geez, what am I doing here? So it, it's it's my pleasure. Thank you, Grace.